Andrea Muslin and I'm the Safeguarding Officer for the Perth Catholic Archdiocese. It's my role as a Safeguarding Officer to heighten the safety and security of children within the church and also outside of the church. To ensure the safety of children, that's impossible, but to increase it and to heighten it, we can do this through the Protective Behaviours Program. Protective Behaviours is an educational program taught to children to prevent sexual abuse from occurring. The Perth Catholic Archdiocese will be running a range of workshops through Child Protection Week and for more information make sure you go to the website at www.perthcatholic.org.au In the meantime I have prepared this short video that I'm hoping you'll take the time out to watch and learn and apply this program to your own children. Thank you and I hope to see you in Child Protection Week. Protective Behaviours is a program that is designed to empower children. So we've talked, about, we've talked about all children being vulnerable because they lack knowledge and they lack skills. Children are vulnerable because predominantly they trust, rely and depend on adults. They rely on adults to keep them safe, they rely on adults to provide for them, they rely on adults to love them, to nurture them and therefore they are pretty much wholly reliant on an adult to grow up and to thrive. Another reason why all children are vulnerable is because they lack the knowledge. They lack knowledge on sexual issues. Now we do try very hard to prevent children from learning about sex, especially under 10 years of age. So if we were to give children knowledge that was beyond their years on this subject, then we ourselves would be harming children by providing a, a knowledge that's outside of their developmental or age limit. So it's not about that. What we need to do is we need to empower children with a range of strategies to increase their personal safety. And that does not necessarily mean giving them sexual knowledge well beyond their years. It means a process of protective behaviours, which I call the baskets of knowledge. For example, a child that, a child that is most likely to be sexually abused will probably fall between the ages of 0 and 10 between 0 and 10, 5 to 8, and even sometimes up to 9 years of age. So if we look at a child around 6 years of age, for an example, and we look at their baskets of knowledge, a child at 6 has a basket of knowledge on stealing, and everything that child knows on stealing is held in that basket of knowledge. That same child has a basket of knowledge on sex, and for most 6-year-old children, that basket of knowledge will be empty. However, the stealing basket is quite often full at six years of age. Children know they're not allowed to steal. And lots of different people in their lives are putting knowledge into that basket. So when asked to steal a chocolate bar, they have a resistance because what they do is they draw into that basket and they draw on the knowledge that's held in the basket and they are able to provide a resistance to the person asking them to steal. I call it the pushback. But ask a child to, to engage in a sexual game well, when they dive into their basket of knowledge on sex, the basket is empty. Therefore, what are they going to draw on? Where is the knowledge going to come from that tells them that it's not okay to play sexual games? That it's not okay to play games with your private parts? It's not okay to keep a secret about the game that you just played or the rude game that you just played. So in other words, there's no pushback. So where a six-year-old child is likely to not steal because they know about stealing and they know what would happen if they did, they don't know anything about sex and their lack of knowledge is what really does place them in harm's way. Well all children as I said are vulnerable to child sexual abuse but there are certain children that are more vulnerable than others. When we look at children who, that come from families or environments where intergenerational abuse occurs they are very high risk of being sexually abused. And that is in a family where um, maybe grandmother was sexually abused, mother was sexually abused, the daughter has been now being sexually abused, there's a chance of the granddaughter being sexually abused. So where sexual abuse carries on down through the generations, that's what we call intergenerational abuse. And children who are, come from those environments are at high risk of being sexually abused. Another high risk category are children who do not reside with a biological family member or a biological parent particularly. And thirdly, children who do come from single parent female families, uh, we now acknowledge that those children are, are very vulnerable as well. And in fact, they, are, they form high risk. And it's not about parenting, 
It's not about poor parenting, it's all about the opportunity to gain access to a child, the opportunity to become the capable guardian. And therefore, mothers who have children are or do provide more opportunity than a mother who is, has a partner or a husband um, living in the home with them. The opportunity is reduced. So in order to protect children as best we can, my number one strategy or my number one piece of advice to parents would be just assume that everybody has the capacity to harm your child. Not everybody will harm your child. Not everybody has an intent to harm your child. But if we assume and we act as if everybody has the capacity to do that, then we are going to be better placed to protect our children. A good example of what I'm talking about would be when I was younger, if I got myself a wound or I had a, had a major injury and I had to go to a hospital or a medical facility to have that injury tended to, the doctors and the nurses would scrub up, they would clean their hands and then they would tend to the wound without any gloves. But then what happened? Uh, we became acutely aware as a community and as a society of the AIDS epidemic and the existence of AIDS and how AIDS can be transferred. And therefore, what the medical profession did is they said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to assume everybody had a, has AIDS and we're going to act accordingly. So that now they wear gloves and they wear gloves for everybody because that is a preventative tool. Whilst they understand not everybody has AIDS, to best protect themselves from contracting AIDS, they wear gloves and we need to, we need to follow that. As parents, we need to assume that everybody has the capacity to harm our children and we need to act accordingly. It's a range of strategies and it's a range of teaching topics that are designed to empower the child not to play the games in the first place, not to suggest that they would keep a secret in relation to a secret that was a secret forever. We talk about uh, that they have the right to feel safe. God gave them the right to feel safe when they were born and nobody should take that away from them. We talk about when they do feel safe to listen to their bodies because their bodies will tell them they feel unsafe. Most children ignore those early warning signs that their bodies give them. We don't want children to ignore them. We want them to listen to them. We want them to become in tune with them and we want them to act accordingly. Children aren't very good problem solvers, so it's also about teaching them how to solve problems. And we talk about problems such as being lost in the supermarket or getting home and mum and dad's not home. Problems such as bullying or people being mean to them or a problem such as someone wanting to show you rude pictures. Well, children might not know how to respond to those problems, so Protective Behaviours teaches them how to do that in an age-appropriate, developmentally appropriate way. There is a big onus or there is a big emphasis on the private parts of the body, so personal um, uh, ownership and awareness of their body parts. We teach children that they don't play games with those parts of their body. They don't let people take photographs of those parts of their body. They don't touch other people's parts and they don't let people touch those parts of their body unless, of course, it's their job to do that, like a dentist. We say to children that their mouth is private. Well, if their mouth is private, nobody should be touching their mouth and people should not be putting things inside their mouth. However, the dentist can because it's his job to do that. But it's only the dentist's job when you're in the dentist's chair. If you were to see the dentist in the park the next day and he wanted to put things in your mouth, that wouldn't be okay. Because when you see him in the park, he's not doing his job. So there's a whole range of strategies we do teach children that can be very easily taught to children. They're not threatening, they're not frightening, but they're very empowering and that's how we fill the basket of knowledge. So if someone asks a small child to play a sexual game, they can draw into their basket of knowledge that we spoke about earlier. And although it might be empty on the sex subject, now it's full. Once we teach children about protective behaviours, the basket is full and there's a whole range of information they can draw on to create that resistance, to create what I talked about earlier, the pushback. And I suppose from um, when we look at it, uh, when we look at child sexual abuse, we, we need to look at it as a crime. It's many things, but it is a crime. And for any crime to occur anywhere in the world, there is a, there is a recipe, and that recipe doesn't change. The recipe includes three ingredients. The person committing the crime needs to be motivated. And what we've found is that many of the child sex offenders commit these offences against children because they're sexually attracted to children. 
to have a sexual orientation towards children. There are other motivators that we would go into in a, in, in, in a, in a training program and after they have a motivation to commit these offences, they must know how to commit the offences. So they must have the ability to do it or maintain a skill set in, in committing these offences. Because they need to know how to do it, but they also need to know how to silence the child so they can continue to do it or they don't get caught. And that's where grooming comes in. Most sex offenders are well aware of grooming. Some sex offenders are well, uh, well aware of grooming because they were groomed as children. But that only accounts for 20% of the recipe. 80% of the recipe for crimes to occur comes down to opportunity. So in this instance, when we talk about protecting children from sexual offenders or from the incidence of child sexual abuse, that's really where we need to concentrate on lowering the opportunity. And all parents have the capacity to do that. It's a matter of taking the time to teach the children child prevention education or the Protective Behaviours Program to lower the opportunity. And by doing that, we will empower our children. I need to make, make, make a note of, it's not an insurance pro policy. Teaching the program doesn't necessarily ensure the child's safety, but it will increase it. And we know that a child that has a lot of knowledge in their basket on the subject are less likely to be selected by a sex offender.